Okay, so welcome back everyone um, to the AD security track. Next up we have Andrew Robbins and Rohan. Um, as you might have guessed uh, by all the Bloodhound logos, we will talk about Bloodhound and, and we will present a methodology um, how you can improve your security posture in Active Directory by utilizing Bloodhound. The stage is yours. Thank you. All right, I hope everyone's uh, well fed and starting to get into that sleepy state so that Andy, Andy can finish putting you to sleep later. <laughs> All right, so we're actually gonna talk about uh, Bloodhound and the adversary resilience methodology today. As you can see from our shirts, we're wearing blue shirts today, so we're actually gonna be blue teamers for once, Ooh. mostly. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I, this, this, this whole thing is gonna be a disaster because neither of us are really blue teamers, but yeah. we're just gonna pretend. So if we mess up, don't heckle us, so. Uh, yep, yeah, that's me. Okay, that's it. Hey. <laughs> hey, that's me. Old picture. All right, so. We're going to start with the cornerstone of every single one of our presentations. This great quote, this great, great quote by John Lambert. John Lambert said, "Defenders think in lists, attackers think in graphs. As long as this is true, attackers win." Yeah, I love it when attackers win. I mean, no, blue team. Um, so this is actually a really important cornerstone of how we founded the Bloodhound project. Um, when we were looking through uh, problems that we were having on pen tests and uh, red teams. Uh, this is kind of what motivated us to design the project as it is. Just like a quick show of hands, how many people have used Bloodhound? How many people have no idea what Bloodhound is? Ouch, that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so Bloodhound is an uh, Active Directory permissions mapping tool that we use to map out lots of different cool things in Active Directory, like who's admin where, who belongs to what groups, and it lets you pathfind from one node to another and figure out how can I go from Andy to domain admins, or Eddie to domain admins, as it were? Um, if you're not aware, we actually very recently released Bloodhound 2.1. Uh, and by recently, I mean like three days ago. Uh, we, we hope that messed up uh, Walter's project because he was presenting on stuff. So, um, so we, we had a few cool features. Uh, the biggest one is resource-based constrained delegation. How many people here have read Elad Shamir's post on resource-based constrained delegation? How many people understood it? <laughs> if anyone raised their hand, like you are a god. So um, that, that is a very complicated blog post. And uh, thankfully, we have the great Will Harmjoy who can uh, dumb it down for us, uh, some dummies over here. And uh, he actually did a lot of work on weaponization using uh, his project, Rubius. And uh, we integrated some of that into the Bloodhound project. Um, this is a really cool attack primitive. Uh, We've been wishing since pretty much we released this project that we had a computer takeover primitive, um, and we didn't until recently. Uh, the only one we had before was LAPS, and uh, LAPS is kind of tricky, not really always supported. However, with this, as long as you have right abilities to this MSDS allowed to act on behalf of other identity attribute, which is you know, such a short and easy to remember yeah. one, um, you can take over a computer too. Um, the only, uh, only thing you need is a user account you control with a service principal name. And uh, thankfully, uh, by default, any user in Active Directory can create 10 of those. So thank you, Microsoft, for really bad defaults as per usual. So in the graph, you'll now see this new wonderful edge, add a lab to act. Uh, if you see this, you can execute this attack, take over a computer, and go on your merry way. We added a bunch of UI improvements. Uh, there's a new database warm-up button. Uh, a lot of people complain to us that queries are really slow, and we say, well, that's Neo4j's fault. Um, so we actually just offloaded the work to Neo4j again, because that's how we do it. Uh, so when you click the database warm-up button, we load the entire graph into memory for you, and then everything is a lot faster. The downside is you take up like eight gigs of RAM, but you know, who needs RAM? Like, that's, that's just cheap. So uh, yeah, make sure you have a lot of RAM before you click that button. Um, once you click it, uh, I think we saw speed ups of like 70% on certain queries. Um, so it's, it's pretty significant. Uh, don't look at your task manager. You'll be really sad. Uh, we actually went back and optimized a lot of queries. Uh, every now and then we do this. We just go through all our pre-built queries, everything in the UI, because we're constantly learning Cypher. If, this may be news to you, but we knew nothing about Cypher before we started using Neo4j. So as we keep learning it, we keep optimizing, and we keep trying to make it better. Just for you guys. This is, this is all for you, not for people. us. Yeah, for, for the people. <laughs> um, another thing people complained to us about is how slow it was to upload data. Well, we fix it, uh, yay. 
Uh, that's a lot faster now for pretty much any data type. There's a few, few exceptions. Um, GPOs in particular are a complete and utter mess, so they're still kind of slow. But uh, GPOs are a mess in Windows too, so that's not really a surprise. Um, a lot of people use the query debug mode for learning how to do Cypher. So uh, turns out that hadn't been updated since we introduced the feature. So we updated it. Now it's a lot easier. And it actually like formats things for you. It puts the query like so you can use it like you know, like you'd expect from something that help you learn. But uh, now it actually works, I promise. Uh, there's tons and tons of bug fixes underneath the hood. Uh, not just from us. Uh, actually, I would say this particular release had more community contribution than just about any other release we've had. Um, particularly from people like uh, Durkion, who is somewhere. Yeah. Um, there, there you go. Is. Yeah, uh, and the the great uh, Crypto Mel and uh, Clement Noden, and yep. uh, we we got a bunch of other things. I I called out a whole bunch of people in my blog post to make sure that everyone got credit where it was due. But uh, this this was really more a bug fix release than anything. Um, but we don't like doing minor releases, so we just made it 2.1. Um, <laughs> There's help text built into the UI. Uh, apparently, nobody knows about this feature. Uh, if you right click on an edge in the Bloodhound UI, it actually pops up a big help window, which even tells you exactly how to exploit stuff. Um, it's really kind of just lazy mode, and it looks like that. Uh, so we actually went back and updated a bunch of help text so nobody can use it. Um, this is actually the help test for Add Allowed to Act. So when you look at this, uh, it'll give you some general information. Uh, it'll, if you go to the abuse info tab over there, it'll actually walk you through how to exploit this entire thing using Rubius. Uh, thanks to Will for doing that wonderful write-up for us. We also made a lot of collector improvements. Uh, the first one is ACL logic sucks less. Um, I say sucks less because the ACL logic is always going to suck because ACLs are really, really, really hard to work with. Uh, anybody who's had the wonderful privilege of working with Windows ACLs knows that they make no freaking sense whatsoever. Uh, and they have all sorts of rules which they just arbitrarily don't follow. So uh, we tried to make it work. Um, I took the uh, suggestion of Vincent Latou over here and uh, redid basically all of it from scratch. And uh, now it mostly works. We'll, we'll go with that. Uh, we made enumeration a lot more reliable. We added a lot more fallback code, like cool things that'll find domain controllers for you. Um, again, lots of bug fixes, many from the community. Uh, we added some new cool properties, like uh, account is sensitive and can't be delegated. Uh, that way, you can actually cross references in the graph without having to go back into AD. Uh, we added no rep pre-auth, so you can do uh, AS rep roasting, which is kind of a different form of curb roasting. Uh, and the last one we have is a bad EDR evasion. <laughs> I say bad EDR evasion for two reasons. One, our evasion is bad. Second of all, what the EDRs were doing was bad. Um, apparently, EDRs were looking at sharphound.bin and saying, hey, it's sharphound. Uh, so we just changed the name, and uh, now we probably won't get signature for another like month. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, that's another uh, little thing we added in there um, at the insistence of some community members. Um, so it's uh, it's always fun to play the cat and mouse game. Uh, I think that's been going on for two years now, and yeah. I don't see it stopping anytime soon. So uh, we'll just keep playing uh, playing the game until someone gets tired. It'll probably be us. Um, Either win or die. Yeah, win or die, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So. That's, that's all our 2.1 features. Uh, if, you haven't, if you've gotten to use it, that's cool. If you get to exploit the uh, new, new attack primitive, like, you got to come tell us, because we're going to geek out so hard about it. Um, we've been, like, we've been like really on edge about all the new stuff that was added. So Yeah. All right. OK, uh, can you guys hear me OK? All right, sweet. So first thing I want to talk to you guys about with Bloodhound from the defensive perspective is a better way and an easier way, a more efficient way to do basic Active Directory uh, auditing. So some things that Bloodhound really simplifies, uh, auditing local admin rights, uh, privileged user behavior, AD object permissions, group policy control, and finding uh, very nasty Kerberos configurations, or misconfigurations, if you will, uh, in your uh, Active Directory. So first, uh, let's look at AD object permissions auditing. So what do I mean by that? What I mean is you have an object in AD. Let's say that it is uh, the domain admins group. So you pull up a duck. You pull up the, well, first of all, you have to have advanced features set, then pull up the object, then go to the security tab, then go to advanced, and then you get this view right here. Uh, there is an ASON here at the very bottom where it says 
uh, David accounting full control. And that's pretty obvious. It's like, all right, that, that user has full control of the domain admins group. That means that David can add arbitrary users to the, uh, to the domain admins group. However, what you usually see is where it says like cert publishers, Windows authorization access, terminal servers, the access is just blank or it'll say like special. So then you get to click the view button and then you get to scroll through this nice view and to try to find what is the ace that is actually applied to this object. Uh, this sucks. Uh, <laughs> and so this is why things like uh, Sean's uh, ACL scanning script, it's why PowerView has git object ACL so that you can get a, a list based output of what the uh, permissions are. Um, but uh, in Bloodhound, way to do this a bloodhound is we already filter out all of the permissions that don't have a currently known abuse primitive. And so we're only showing you the aces that actually matter, so to say, from that a- That we know matter. That we know about from yeah. an object takeover perspective. So for example, in the bloodhound database, we have our domain admins group there on the right. And then we have the domain user objects over there on the left. Uh, if we click on uh, one of those users, we can start looking at how to audit this using Bloodhound uh, on a per user uh, basis. So if we look at the inbound object control, we can see that there are three principles that have explicit control of a domain admin. There's 47 actual users that have control through security group delegation. And then the transitive object controllers, this query probably took like 10 minutes to run. The number is something over 100,000. And what that, transitive object control, what that means is that every object in the directory has an attack path that gets them to this principle using only uh, uh, using yes, only yes. LDAP. We're only using like 80 object takeover. So you don't have to laterally move to other systems. You don't have to password spray. You don't have to do any of that garbage. You can just do this all through LDAP and only talking to one <laughs> domain controller. Um, but even this process already is kind of tedious because we're having to click through each user. Then we have to expand that out. And really, the only thing I care about is just tell me what non-domain admins can control any domain admin and how. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't have time to go through this GUI. I don't have time to run a script. I don't care. I just, this is all I care about is what matters. Who can take over a DA that's not a DA? Tell me who it is and how they can do it. So I don't expect you to be able to read this. Uh, the slides are going to be available afterwards, so you can copy and paste this if you want. But after you've done your Bloodhound data collection and you have a very well populated database, you can run uh, this Cypher query right here. And what this is doing is it's grabbing any user that belongs to the domain admins group and is saving that to a, a variable. And then we're saying, all right, now show me any, any object that has explicit control or group delegated control of any of those domain admins that are not a domain admin. And show me what that looks like uh, in the graph. And it looks like this. Super easy. Uh, this query finishes in like three seconds, maybe. And so again, on the very far right, we have the domain admins users. Oh, this is, by the way, this is real data. We have the domain admins group on the far right, the users, and then this is probably the administrators group. This is probably the, do this is probably the uh, account operators group. And then we have these like random other groups that either were added to the administrators group or they have some kind of direct control of a domain admin. So if you're looking at, if you, if you watched, if you, if you watched uh, Sean's talk about like isolating domain admins, this is one way that you can do this super, super easily looking at the, uh, the object takeover prim uh, uh, primitives are possible uh, just using Bloodhound. This is like two years worth of knowledge and learning that Andy and I have done that he just dumped on you in like 30 seconds. So <laughs> if you don't entirely get it, like it's not, it's not your fault, yeah. I promise. We'll also, we'll put a blog post out about this uh, stuff as well so you can like read through it at your leisure. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to look at is uh, group policy control auditing. All right, who has ever tried to get a handle on <laughs> what GPOs apply to your domain admins? <clears throat> And who has control of those GPOs that is not a domain admin? Okay, you don't count. <laughs> you don't count either. <laughs> All right, why not? It's impossible. It's really, really difficult. So here's what the process looks like at a, at a high level. 
First, we're going to find each domain admin user and every computer they use. Then we're going to, we're going to find those objects in the OU tree, because again, we're looking at GPO, and that's going to be linked to OUs and sites and domains. Then we're going to enumerate the group policy links to those OU sites and domains, work out whether each GPO actually applies to each of those users and computers, which is always really fun. Uh, and then finally, we're going to audit, audit the permissions on each of those GPOs. Uh, so every step is pain in, <laughs> in, this, in this process. So let's do it. All right, here's my administrator user. So I find him in a duck, uh, him or her in a duck. And then I want to see what OU that user belongs to. So this user just belongs to the, the user's OU. So OK, now, now I have a different UI I need to look at. So I'm going to look at group policy management. Uh, here's a default domain policy. So that's going to apply to that administrator user. OK, well, uh, is that link actually enabled? Yes. Uh, is it enforced? This matters. Uh, in this instance, it's not. So I'm going to keep track of that. Uh, also, I need to look at whether the OU containing that user blocks inheritance. Are we having fun yet? Uh, but wait, we're not done. We also need to look at WIMI filters. So is there a WIMI filter that is excluding this user from having this GPO applied to them? In this instance, no, I don't have any WIMI filters in my, in my fake domain. Um, but in real life, uh, you will probably see a fairly long, fairly long list here. OK. So in this view, this group policy management view, you cannot see the permissions of the GPO. There is no right-click properties in this view to look at the GPO. So now you get to go back into ADUC. And you get to find not default domain policy, but you get to find 31B2F340-01, you know, yada, yada, yada. You get to find the, um, the quote unquote GUID, uh, <coughs> which is actually not globally unique nope. uh, for that uh, relevant policy. Now you can finally look at, look at the permissions on that object. And then you're back here. You're, you're looking at the aces in here, like which ones actually matter, which ones are inherited. Uh, do these actually apply? Are, are there any deny aces that might screw things up? Like, this is um, not good. <laughs> uh, this is pretty bad. So yes, of course, this process can be scripted. There are several people in this room who have scripted out this process. Um, but this is a Bloodhound talk, so we're going to do this with Bloodhound. <laughs> so what do I want? I just want to know which non-DAs can control any GPO that applies to any DA and how. That's really all that I care about. All right, so we'll jump back into Cypher. Uh, this first thing, all this is going to do is find the GPOs that apply to the domain admins. And then we can, we can render that. So all of these GPOs, again, this is real data. The GPOs are linked to the domain object, chase that down the OU tree to the members of the domain admins group. And you know, luckily, these domain admins, they're, they're contained within the same OU. Uh, more often than not, in our experience, domain admins are like scattered all across the, the OU structure. Um, but this query will find them uh, regardless. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Those, okay. those queries are going to be in the slide deck that we share afterwards, so yeah. don't, don't worry about taking pictures or anything like yeah. that. You'll, you'll just be able to copy them out. Yep. Uh, okay. So then things get a little more complicated. Hence why I said Slight, don't bother taking pictures. Slightly more complicated. But basically, what this query is doing is saying, all right, I now know what GPOs apply to my domain admins. Now tell me, through either explicit permissions or group delegated permissions, who controls each of those GPOs and exclude anybody who's a domain admin. I don't care if a domain admin has control of it. I, they're, the, they're the people I'm trying to protect here. So uh, the result of that, again, this is real data, looks like this. So what do we have? We have two different groups, this group right here and this group right here, that have several different permissions that give them control of the GPOs. Uh, why does this matter? Because with GPO, you can do anything. Uh, I can make you run a startup script. I can give your computer uh, SE debug privileges for all domain users. Uh, if you can dream it, you can do it with GPO. That's a wonderful and complicated beast. Then these are all the users that belong to those groups. And you can see that we're unrolling that out. That's just a native thing in a graph. It's very, very simple for it to do. And so if I'm looking at protecting my domain admins, I need to protect them from GPO attacks. 
now I know I don't have to I don't have to like chase out all the other attack paths that that end up in the compromise of one of those users on the left, uh, which in this domain all those users are like spraying their credentials all over the place. All I'm all I'm caring about at this step is get rid of those offending aces on the GPOs that apply to the domain admins, so that only domain admins can apply GPO to themselves. And then we can periodically audit this. And just it's very very simple. Uh, excuse me, very very simple. Uh, Process? Process, yeah, thank you. Is this my water? Yes. It is now. Yep. Okay, so this is, this is like, this is the tip of the iceberg of like very, very easy basic auditing that you can do with Bloodhound. Uh, so next one I'm gonna look at is finding more uh, systemic issues. So three things uh, that come to mind. Least privilege violations, cross domain attack paths, and attack paths to quote unquote DA. And I say, I say DA in quotes because uh, as Sean points out in a couple of his blogs, domain admin is not the be all end all necessarily exclusively uh, unto itself. That you have account operators, you have enterprise admins, you have domain controllers, you have all kinds of different principles that can give you the same equivalent access as, as a domain admin can. Okay. So first, uh, one way to look at least privilege violations uh, and two different perspectives. One is inbound permissions, so we can find computers in the network that have way too many admins. Uh, this is really easy to do if like domain users was added to the local admins group. That's simple. You can just run Nessus and find that. Uh, if you have a group that has domain users added into it, Nessus is not going to tell you that. No script is going to tell you that. It's not going to unroll that out automatically for you. Or forget domain users. If you just have like the everyone principle, or the authenticated users principle, mm -hmm. or some group that somebody decided, hey, every, every domain user gets to go in this group, and I'm gonna make that group local admin everywhere. We can find that really, really easily with Bloodhound. So again, it's two, three, four, it's six lines of cipher, seven lines of cipher, and the result of this is we have two columns of data. We have the name of the computer in AD, and we have the number of unique admins on that computer. We can take that data, we can massage it into whatever format we want. You can export from CSV, you can put that into Excel, you can build out a chart, whatever. Uh, as part of this talk, we are releasing a tool that will help you build these visualizations very, very easily. And one of those visualizations looks like this. So this, these are the computers in the network sorted by the number of unique admins. So the two top computers there each have approximately 10,000 users uh, that are local admin on there. Then the, there's, a, there's a significant drop off and there's like something like 200 admins on each of these systems. This is not based on real data. Yeah. Doing this based on real data would obviously be a bad idea if, if I wanted to show you host names. Uh, but in reality, this usually doesn't follow this kind of like extreme and then a, a huge drop off. It's usually it's usually much more subtle. There's usually a, a very subtle drop off, and so you would have a computer that has domain users added to the local admins group. Obviously, that's bad. That's usually pretty easy to remediate. Uh, but then you have all these instances where you have groups that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of users in them that are granted local admin rights. You can ferret all that stuff out with this. I challenge you to go find this in ADUC. If you can do it, you're, uh, it's, yeah. you're an AD god. That yeah. You can do anything. Yeah. The world is your oyster. You are Sean Metcalf. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what about outbound permissions? Uh, again, in ADUC, there is no way to say for any given user, what permissions does that user have? It doesn't exist. Uh, everything is inbound permissions that you have to look at from either local admin or AD objects or whatever. Uh, if, you, if, I, if I just pull up Rohan's account in Active Directory, I have no clue what privileges he has unless I take a a stab at it with like, well, he belongs to a group called server admins, so I, I guess that means he has admin rights on servers. Don't know. <laughs> uh, with Bloodhound, it's a lot easier. We can, we can find uh, outbound permissions for any object very, very easily. So what about stale object control? Uh, thanks again to our friend Durkjan uh, over there. Say hello, Durkjan. Or say uhat. Uh, Thanks to Durkjan, we have a really great case study of why this matters and uh, an easy methodology that we can go through to protect ourselves 
from a really nasty attack or an attacker that has access to our, to our Active Directory. And of course, I'm talking about Priv Exchange. Is there any, everybody familiar with Priv Exchange? This was like the most terrifying headline that, that, that came out in like the last two months, I guess, because it's, it's an exchange o day. It's one click to domain admin. Oh my god. Uh, the TLDR on this is that whenever you install Exchange ex the, and you, you don't use a split permissions model, which nobody does, <laughs> uh, Exchange grants itself severe control <laughs> of the entire directory, uh, the domain head, domain admins, every object, uh, every GPO, every OU, you name it, Exchange has control of it. This makes your Exchange servers as sensitive as domain controllers because if an attacker has access to an Exchange server, in a lot of instances, they can just give themselves the ability to DC sync, or they can give themselves the ability to add arbitrary principles to the domain admins group. So let's look at uh, DC sync, for instance. Uh, this, uh, this view, again, this is real data. We're looking at the domain head, which is over there in the very far right. And we are looking at every principle that has control of the domain head. And that, that control comes in a few different flavors. It can be like full control. It could be right DACL. It could be all extended rights. All extended rights. Um, it could be the combination of git changes and git changes all, which is what you need to be able to do uh, DC sync, whatever. So here are all the users and computers that have control of the domain head. These are all of our clients' exchange servers. This is the exchange trusted subsystem. This is the exchange windows permissions group. It has the ability to change the security descriptor on the domain head. So all those exchange servers have that privilege. The exchange installer is kind of a disaster. So yeah. if you haven't audited exchange permissions yet in your domain, yeah, you should probably. You're gonna wanna do that, yeah. yeah. So we zoom in on that specific offending ace. It is the exchange windows permissions group has right DACL on the domain head. Uh, we can also plot that out so we can see more visually what the impact of that is. So here are the exchange servers again. They have uh, the right DACL privilege through uh, group delegation to the domain head. So our, our argument is it doesn't need that. If you look in the documentation for the permissions that Exchange 2016 gives itself, I believe, uh, this, this privilege is not even listed. Uh, it is listed for Exchange Server 2007 uh, and a few others. But our pitch to the client was get rid of that privilege and you're not gonna break anything and you're gonna get rid of an uh, enormous attack surface because all your exchange servers, they're just hanging out there waiting to be popped. And the attack paths possible to the exchange servers in this environment was really nasty. Actually, something I forgot to include in here, uh, from a different environment, from a Bloodhound user who wants to remain anonymous, uh, the domain users group had been given local admin rights on all the exchange servers. Why not? That's the same as making domain users, domain admins. It's the exact same thing. It's just one extra step in between. Just to, just to clarify in case this is a little confusing, if you are an admin on a server and you escalate to system, you are that server in Active Directory. Uh, that's a piece of information that a lot of people just don't know about. Yeah. Um, and it makes, server, it makes computer objects just as dangerous as users. Yeah. So. So if you've ever told somebody that you need to remove a permission, you need to remove local <laughs> admin rights, whatever, what is the number one question that you get back? What is this gonna break? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question, it's a valid question. Uh, thankfully, uh, Windows Eventing uh, can come to the rescue and it can tell us exactly what's gonna break uh, if we start removing those permissions. So in Active Directory, uh, you, you know, we saw the security descriptor GUI before where we were seeing the permissions. That's the DACL, that's the discretionary access control list that defines what permissions exist on that object for what principles. To the right of that is the SACL or the system access control list. And this controls auditing for this object. And caveat here is that you do need to enable uh, uh, advanced audit features in Active Directory to get access to some of this data. Um, but again, if we look at this offending ace right here, we have one group that has one permission to one object. So we just need to add one SACL ace to determine whether or not we're gonna break something by removing that one offending permission. And if, 
if an Exchange server does use that permission, uh, it's going to generate an event because the computer used that group membership to execute that privilege. So we can just add one very simple ace to the sackle. We have the Exchange Trusted Subsystem. It's a success, uh, applies to this object only, and it's for the modified permissions privilege. So now, any time that an Exchange server modifies permissions on the domain head, you're going to generate a 5136 event that you can then ingest into Splunk, QRadar, uh, whatever you want to do. Uh, don't just leave it in the Windows event log on the domain controller because it's going to get uh, it's going to get purged when that when that log gets full. Out of curiosity, how many people have actually like messed with sackles on any objects? Okay, how many people have actually seen that auditing tab before? How many people did it on accident? <laughs> okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> so the idea is. We now have the ability to see if an Exchange server ever actually uses this permission. So now we wait. <laughs> and the end result of going through this exercise with our client who had, uh, they already had really robust uh, WEF architecture, really good SIEM or SIM or however we, I don't think we've decided how to say that word. How do you say it, Sean? SIM. SIM. That's awesome. canonical now. Uh, <laughs> The end result of this is that the total number of events we collected for 14 months was zero. Uh, we removed the offending aces. Nothing broke. And we did this five months before Dirkdown did his work. So when the headline hit, the client didn't care. <laughs> because the offending permission that made it possible for this attack to work uh, didn't exist. So you could do the man in the middle position. Uh, you could relay the credential for the computer account. You could do all that stuff. but the permissions that the exchange servers had were very, very limited. And you couldn't actually do anything interesting with that. So the client was already protected. And they were happy. We were happy. Super, super happy. By the way, one eternity later is whatever you define as an eternity. If you decide that two months is good enough to decide that you don't need that anymore, that's all you need. Uh, if you decide two days, more power to you. It's, it's your call. Uh, yeah. 14 months in this case, because our client was very, very, very Paranoid numbers, about it, yeah. uh, so yeah. their 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 exchange uh, uh, their exchange admin uh, said that this would completely break exchange. Yep. Uh, email would be down. The CEO would be on the phone. Uh, the company would be on fire. Microsoft would end support. Yep. Like you're just you're 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 killing yourself. Like yeah. like removing this privilege. Spoiler alert: nothing broke, and the CEO still got his emails. What's that? 2016, I think. I think. Yeah. If I recall correctly, um, but interestingly, be, like only be, like because they were running a current-ish version of Exchange. I don't know if it's a, a more new one than that. Um, the permissions that were there were put there by the Exchange Server 2003 installer. <laughs> when you upgrade Exchange, it does nothing to remove those <laughs> legacy permissions. Yeah, if you think Exchange is cleaning up after itself, you are it dead is, wrong. It is not. And it is still using the same groups to uh, have the Exchange servers in. So the, the Exchange servers, they have these permissions that uh, maybe were necessary 16 years ago. Probably not. Probably not. Uh, <laughs> and, and the permissions are still there. So like Rohan said, this is something you should audit for. All right, what about cross-domain attack paths? This is kind of interesting because, as we all know, domain trusts are not a security boundary. And if you go to Will and Lee's talk tomorrow, you'll see that something else is not a trust boundary. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so unfortunately, a lot of organizations do treat domain trust boundaries as uh, security boundaries. And it was just maybe a merger acquisition. Uh, maybe some IT admin thought that domain trust uh, boundaries were security boundaries. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, that's the situation they're in. Uh, and the, the remediation or the fix for this is to re-architect the entire forest. That's a lot of money that you're paying to uh, uh, Microsoft Premium Field Engineering. Uh, or you're paying other people a lot of money to re-architect that. And you talk about something's going to break. Oh, my <laughs> god. So 
here's an example of, again, the same environment we were looking at. We're just looking at, is it possible to go from domain user in one domain to domain admin in another domain? And of course it is. Spoilers. Uh, yeah, spoiler alert. So we have the domain users in one domain, and they have admin rights on four different computers. They have four different choices they can go to. Then there were five different privileged accounts that were logged on to each of these systems, and all of this was in the same domain. Then these users have been added to a group in a foreign domain, in, in the domain two, and this group had admin rights on this computer. So if you're following along as an attacker, if I'm a domain user, I pivot to this machine, I steal this guy's password, I use my, my group membership here to pivot to this machine, and on this machine, this user was logged on, this user was added to a group in a different domain, and this group has full control of the domain admins group in that other domain. If you think this is rare, uh, just about every multi-domain environment we've seen has a path like this. This yeah. is very, very common um, with memberships between domains or yeah. admin rights across domains. Like, I think probably like 90% of what yeah. we've seen. So. Actually, the entire reason we created Bloodhound in the first place is because of, uh, because of this case. Um, huge organization, uh, over 100 domains in one forest, uh, global conglomerate type company, super, super good security posture, so uh, no MSO8067, uh, no Eternal Blue, which was still NSA tradecraft at the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, nothing that you could just easily, like, password guess or whatever. Like we're, we're only able to abuse misconfigurations in the directory to achieve our objective. So by the third red team that we were doing for this company, we got DA in one domain and couldn't turn that into enterprise admin at the forest root. Uh, so we go back, we try again, can't do it. Then we start, we start POCing out Bloodhound which was called test.html at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Should have had a screenshot of that in here. Oh, it's so bad. Uh, it's terrible. So test.html uh, we used to find an attack path from domain admin in this like, like random backwater domain to uh, the one and only enterprise admin at the forest root. It crossed through eight domain trust boundaries. And along the way, we were never popping a domain admin along the way. It was all this like, uh, like server admins and stuff. Yeah, like that. server admins, like the, like the kind of the, the underbelly of of Active Directory uh, control. Like just like Sean was saying with uh, ESAE, it's fantastic for protecting domain admins. It would have done nothing for protecting against uh, this kind of attack path because you have your server admins and your workstation admins and all that. So again, we're looking at this from like a systemic issue perspective. So what? What, how, can, how can we quantify like, how bad is, this, is a situation like, from one domain to another between all domains? And the answer is uh, with Bloodhound. So a little bit of cipher. We can uh, grab every computer uh, in a specific domain, and we can return all the admins on each of those computers that don't belong to the same domain as that computer. So I'm a user in domain A, I have admin rights on a computer in domain B. The output looks something like this. So the right-hand column, we're looking at foreign admins, 41, 29, 29, 29, et cetera. So the top one, there, there are 41 users from a different domain that have admin rights on that one computer. So that's the way, like depending on how you think about that, that's 41 potential attack paths from one domain into another. Um, and then that grows exponentially as you start multiplying these things uh, by each other. We can visualize this uh, with a, a flowchart or a, a sinky diagram. diagram. Yeah. So this is a little convoluted to read, um, but it's not too bad. So starting from domain one, for instance, we have 23,000 users that have admin rights on 8,700 computers in domain two. Uh, from domain three, we have 182 users that have admin rights on 1,500 computers in domain two. So basically, like the, the pattern that emerges here is that domain one is basically accessible from any other domain. 
uh, and there's a lot of work to do with uh, trimming uh, that privilege if it's if it's strategically necessary, if if that is not an acceptable uh, attack path possibility. Domain two is like relatively exposed. Domain three has uh, relatively a small number of computers that are exposed to foreign admins, uh, and that's like ten thousand fifty three. Is that right? Can I do ar arithmetic? Probably not. <laughs> A thousand, yeah. A thousand fifty-three. Thank you, thank you, Jared. Yeah. So we can we uh, we can visualize this and we can see immediately like where the big issues are. Now, for this, we're, we're only looking at local admin rights, but we can do this with any, with anything. We could do this with GPO control. We could do it with control of user objects. Uh, you name it. Uh, every attack path possibility that the Bloodhound database tracks, we can apply the same methodology to find these. Uh, I guess these links between the different domains. <laughs> All right, is a food coma hitting yet? Am I speaking loudly and quickly enough? Okay. <laughs> so uh, today we are introducing a, uh, two different tools uh, that we are generally referring to them as Bloodhound Analytics. The first one is a Power BI workbook called bloodhoundanalytics.pbix. This is obviously a very creative uh, name that we paid marketing people a lot of money to come up with. This is a proof of concept charting uh, power book, uh, or workbook in Power BI. And the concept here is just to show you how Power BI can be used to make automatic connections using uh, saved queries to the Neo4j database and then render that output uh, without having to go through the rigmarole of using the console and exporting to Excel and going through all that, all that nightmare. Uh, so there's several built-in queries that are useful that with corresponding visualizations that are already built. They're very pretty visualizations for what it's worth. They're not too bad. Uh, we'll also have a blog post that shows how you can expand this yourself. If you have some kind of uh, clever uh, chart that you want to uh, show, I'll show you exactly how to do that using the Power BI uh, query, or not query language, but like, Data massage language. I don't know. I don't know what you would refer to it as. The Power BI language. You should have named it a test.pbix. Just oh, to follow yeah. tradition. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, this is released under GPLv3, uh, and then it's going to be up on GitHub after this talk is over. And here's what it looks like. So you saw this chart before, where it was computers by number of admins. Uh, then also, if we zoom in on the upper right, we can see percentage of users with a path to DA, 100%. Wow, things are not looking good for you. Uh, we use this in our service line, uh, where we use Bloodhound to help people get rid of these attack paths. And we're constantly coming back to this after we say, all right, we're going to make this change in the directory. And we think it's a killer awesome idea. And it's going to solve all your problems. And it's going to be like, remove, remove an ace from the, from the admin SD holder object. Or remove the control from GPO that we were looking at before. And nine, nine times out of 10, this number stays the exact same. Yeah, we, we were very quickly disabused of our like, initial notions of how easy this was going to be. Yeah. Our, first, our first one was not fun. Yeah. It's actually incredibly difficult to defeat an attack graph, uh, but it's, it's possible. Uh, so you also saw this one already. So these are the computers by the number of admins there are. Um, then something else we have is like top five highest privileged groups by number of computers you have admin rights on. So domain admins, that's going to be pretty obvious. Uh, sometimes. Uh, you have like uh, an HR group that pops up here. And it's like, hmm, how did this happen? Uh, so it's a very easy way to get like quick wins or like low-hanging fruit that you can find uh, uniquely using an attack graph that you cannot find using built-in tools in AD. And it would be very, very difficult to script this out, I think, if you're not using a graph. OK, so that's part one. Part two is bloodhoundanalytics.py. So this gives us QA checks for data completeness. Um, one of the biggest pieces of information that is uh, severely lacking in most databases that we look at is user session data. Uh, because most users will just do one, so to say, loop of session data collection. And the coverage they have of where users are logged on in the environment is maybe like 5%. And so you're missing 95% of users for where they're logged on. And you're missing huge uh, attack path opportunities. Huge. We get the best attack paths. Um, you have basic stats regarding the number of nodes and edges and their different types. Uh, so you can see you know, how comprehensive your data is there. Critical asset checks. 
Uh, so who's a local admin and domain controller? Who can RDP do a domain controller? Things that are universal to any Active Directory. Low-hanging fruit. Uh, where are domain users added as, lo as local admin? Where does the authenticated users principle have uh, execute decom privilege? Things that should be very, very easy wins to get rid of that if you don't get rid of them have a hugely negative uh, impact on your security posture. Cross domain attack paths we also look at and this is uh, of course also released under GPL v3 license. And we'll be on GitHub after the talk. So we have one slide left. Is there anything, anything else you want to say? No, I think we covered it pretty well. Okay. Everyone looks asleep. All right, well, <laughs> we, have a, we have a lot of time for questions, but hopefully uh, this is a good uh, way to make you think about defenders being able to think in graphs now and how we are trying to make this more practical and approachable from the defensive side. Bloodhound is and always will be an offensive tool first and exclusively. It is not a defensive tool, but we're trying to extract as much defensive value out of it as we can. Uh, here's our contact info. You can join the Bloodhound Slack. There's like 3,100 people in there now, and awesome conversations are happening all the time. And so uh, with that, we'll uh, leave it to questions. Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. <laughs> are there any questions? So thank you for the talk again. <laughs> and um, um, my question is about uh, how to integrate uh, like uh, attack paths uh, via stuff like uh, backup systems, system center management systems, or operation manager. Is like it how possible to tie this or is this idea to integrate like, something like this? Like tie this into some kind of vol management or system management process that already exists? We, we have thoughts about that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's all I want to say right now. <laughs> good, good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk and thank also you. for the tool. <laughs> it's a great tool. Um, uh, the, you mentioned the Windows event 5136, and you mentioned that the client waited 14 months. Yeah. Let's assume I don't want to wait 14 months. Did I, do I still? Let's say I wait three months. Yeah. <laughs> if I, if something happens after that, will I oh. still see the event? In, so I could monitor that maybe something really broke or it didn't actually yes. show up, and so on. If it's still yeah. monitored, you'll see a deny. So yeah. Yeah. then you'd just be able to say like, oh, why did our CEO stop receiving email? Yeah. And you look back through your logs and you see, hey, it got denied. So then you go back, add it in and perf exchange pops you the next day. So Right. That's, that's a great question. Like you don't want to have something silently, you don't have some kind of like critical procedure silently fail uh, without any way to troubleshoot that. So yeah, that, leaving that ace behind, uh, like Rohan said, you'll, get, you'll just get a deny event. Um, excuse me. So you'll you'll see the uh, the event pop up so it doesn't silently fail. Hey, I've got a question more related to OPSEC for when you guys are running Bloodhound. Oh, hit me. How many times do you see? So you know, in general, when you're enumerating all the admins in the environment and all the sessions, how many times do you see your your client come back to you and say, "Well, okay, we saw this because you know we have internal net blows, or we just have." Uh, robust auditing, and we saw all of a sudden one guy is asking every system in the environment. Do you want the answer questions. that'll make you happy, or the real answer? I, I want the real answer. Because the real answer is almost never. Okay. Um, there are very few people who have robust enough NetFlow yeah. to actually pick up on this. Some of our more like advanced clients that we run into, they're starting to pick up on it just based on some behaviors and stuff like that. Uh, Sharpound is not quiet by any means. Right. It is a super super loud tool when you run its default configuration, yeah. um, but which. It's only loud if someone's listening. Exactly. If, right. if you're not looking for that particular brand of data, then it pretty much just flies into the radar in most yeah. places. Thanks. So. Uh, yeah, maybe follow up. Yep. <laughs> um, I assume you are aware of Microsoft ATA, the advanced uh -huh. threat analytics, and they kind of copycatted <laughs> the lateral movement uh, hmm, path know, uh, thing. What's your opinion on that? I don't think we have a comment about that. Yeah. <laughs> We have a good relationship with ATA guys, so we'll just. We, yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we seriously we do. No, we, God, that came out wrong. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Uh, if there aren't any more questions, we have stickers. 
uh, at the front, but if you take a sticker, you also have to take a business card because our boss makes us do uh, business development when we go to conferences. So uh, this is a trap. It's up here for you to uh, take. Uh, there's like little piles uh, meted out for everybody. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you.